grappling further with the special theory of relativity, I want to try to convey to the reader what is involved in the new phrase space-time, because that is, from a philosophical and imaginative point of view, perhaps the most important of all the novelties that Einstein introduced. Suppose you wish to say where and when some event has occurred, say, an explosion on an aircraft. You will have to mention four quantities, say, the latitude and longitude, the height above the ground, and the time. According to the traditional view, the first three of these give the position in space, while the fourth gives the position in time. When people said that space had three dimensions, they meant just this, that three quantities were necessary in order to specify the position of a point in space, but that the method of assigning these quantities was wholly arbitrary. You could use any directions and origin for your measurements. But the only arbitrary elements in the reckoning of time were thought to be the unit and the point of time from which the reckoning started. One could reckon in hours, days or years, in Greenwich time or New York time, both these were trivial. There was thought to be nothing corresponding to the liberty of choice as to the method of fixing position in space. People regarded time and space as quite distinct. The theory of relativity has changed this. If one event is simultaneous with another in one reckoning, it will precede it in another and follow it in a third. Moreover, the space and time reckonings are no longer independent of each other. If you alter the way of reckoning position in space, you may also alter the time interval between two events. If you alter the way of reckoning time, you may also alter the distance in space between two events. Space and time are no longer independent, any more than the three dimensions of space are. We still need four quantities to determine the position of an event, but we cannot, as before, divide off one of the four as quite independent of the other three. It is not quite true to say that there is no longer any distinction between time and space. As we have seen, there are time-like intervals and space-like intervals. But the distinction is of a different sort from that which was formerly assumed. There is no longer a universal time which can be applied without ambiguity to any part of the universe. There are only the various proper times of the various bodies in the universe, which agree approximately for two bodies which are not in rapid motion, but never agree exactly, except for two bodies which are at rest relatively to each other. The picture of the world which is required for this new state of affairs is as follows. Suppose an event, E, occurs to me, and simultaneously a flash of light goes out from me in all directions. Suppose I could observe a person in Sirius, and the Syrian could observe me. Anything which the Syrian does, and which I see before the event E occurs to me, is definitely before E. Anything the Syrian does after seeing the event E is definitely after E. But anything that the Syrian does before seeing the event E, which I see after the event E has happened, is not definitely before or after E. Since light takes years to travel from Sirius to the Earth, about 17 years in Sirius may be called contemporary with E. Dr. A. A. Robb has suggested a point of view which helps understanding this state of affairs. He maintained that one event can only be said to be definitely before another if it can influence that other in some way. Influences spread from a centre at varying rates. Newspapers exercise an influence emanating from London at an average rate of about 20 miles an hour, rather more for long distances. Anything a person does on account of reading a newspaper article is clearly subsequent to the printing of the newspaper. Sounds travel much faster, and radio signals travel with the velocity of light, so that nothing quicker can ever be hoped for. Now, what someone does in consequence of receiving a radio message is done after the message was sent. The meaning here is quite independent of conventions as to the measurement of time. 
But anything that is done while the message is on its way cannot be influenced by the sending of the message and cannot influence the sender until some little time after the sending of the message. That is to say, if two bodies are widely separated, neither can influence the other except after a certain lapse of time. What happens before that time has elapsed cannot affect the distant body. Suppose, for example, that some notable event happens on the sun. There is a period of 16 minutes on the earth, during which no event on the earth can have influenced or been influenced by the said notable event on the sun. This gives a substantial ground for regarding that period of 16 minutes on the earth as neither before nor after the event on the sun. The paradoxes of the special theory of relativity are only paradoxes because we are unaccustomed to the point of view and in the habit of taking things for granted when we have no right to do so. This is especially true as regards the measurement of lengths. In daily life, our way of measuring lengths is to apply a ruler or some other measure. At the moment when the ruler is applied, it is at rest relatively to the body which is being measured. Consequently, the length that we arrive at by measurement is the proper length, that is to say, the length as estimated by an observer who shares the motion of the body. We never, in ordinary life, have to tackle the problem of measuring a body which is in continual motion. And even if we did, the velocities of visible bodies on the earth are so small relatively to the earth that the anomalies dealt with by the theory of relativity would not appear. But in astronomy, or in the investigation of atomic structure, we are faced with problems which cannot be tackled in this way. We cannot make the sun stand still while we measure it. If we are to estimate its size, we must do so while it is in motion relatively to us. And similarly, if you want to estimate the size of an electron, you will have to do so while it is in rapid motion, because it never stands still for a moment. This is the sort of problem with which the theory of relativity is concerned. Measurement, with a ruler, when it is possible, gives always the same result, because it gives the proper length of a body. But when this method is not possible, we find that curious things happen, particularly if the body to be measured is moving very fast relatively to the observer. When two bodies are moving relatively to each other, lengths on either appear shorter to the other than to themselves. This is the Lorentz contraction, which was first invented to account for the result of the Michelson-Morley experiment, but which now emerges naturally from the fact that the two observers do not make the same judgment of simultaneity. The way in which simultaneity comes in is this. We say that two points on a body are a metre apart, when we can simultaneously apply one end of a metre rule to the one and the other end to the other. If now two people disagree about simultaneity and the body is in motion, they will obviously get different results from their measurements. Thus the trouble about time is at the bottom of the trouble about distance. If the body is moving very much more slowly than light, the alterations produced by the motion are very small. But if the body is moving nearly as fast as light, the effects become very great. The apparent increase of mass in swiftly moving particles had been observed and the right formula had been found before the invention of the special theory of relativity. Lorentz had arrived at the formulae called the Lorentz transformation, which embody the whole mathematical essence of the special theory of relativity. But it was Einstein who showed that the whole thing was what we ought to have expected and not a set of makeshift